Fight fans, welcome to the PBC Podcast, brought to you by Premier Boxing Champions with your host, Kenneth Buhari and Michael Rosenthal. Welcome everyone to the PBC Podcast. I'm Kenneth Buhari. I'm Michael Rosenthal, editor of USA Today's Boxing Junkie. Thank you guys for joining us for another beautiful week of boxing. We've got the 154-pound king, unified world super welterweight champion, Jermel Ironman Charlo stopping by. Plus, of course, the PBC fight of the week. And in today's toe-to-toe segment, we're going to go back and examine five major fights and what would have occurred if both fighters were in their prime. And that includes pound for pound. Because, you know, sometimes, you know, fighters prime may be in different weight classes. Exactly. So we'll look at the pound yeah. for pound mm-hmm. um, as well. But first, Mike and I want to congratulate Clarissa Shields on another big win last Saturday. Shields became boxing's first ever two division undisputed world champion, male or female, with her decision win over Marie Eve DeCare. Truly a pioneer in the sport and doing a lot of great things, I think, Mike. Right. She's special, and what she's accomplished is special. Um, she deserves a lot of credit, a lot of kudos. Uh, she, as, you, as you just alluded to, I think she also deserves credit for promoting women's boxing, which she's done yeah. really well. Um, here's the thing, though, is I just wish that she had worthy adversaries. Katie Taylor might be the next best woman boxer, uh, and they're actually talking about making that fight. Uh, Shields understandably wants a lot of money to drop down from 54 to 47 for that fight. And I think she could make seven figures if they do it on pay-per-view. I mean, that's from my limited uh, business perspective. Uh, I just don't know if it's a good idea for her to drop down that low, though. Remember, Shields has fought as high as 168. Yeah. You know, I really wonder... uh, I mean, I, I, I enjoy seeing her box and I want her to continue to box, but I really wonder whether her genuine challenges will end up being in MMA and not in boxing. Yeah, I think it's certainly possible. That's, I mean, it's a good way to put it. I don't know if she can get down to 47 and she can do it in a healthy manner or she'll be 100%. If she can get down to 147, seems like a risky play, but, you know, I'm amazed she's gotten down to 54. So uh, more more credit to her, more, more props to her. And I... I you know, truly hope that she does find that she's um, amazing one rival. Yeah. You know, who, yeah. Um, that person who might be able to elevate her, her amazingness that, you know, for her greatness. But for now, she in her weight class and several others, she has um, no peer. Now, speaking of no peers, we have another anniversary this week, the 50th anniversary of the first fight between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. March 8th, 1971, in Madison Square Garden. The fight of the century, or so it was called. Frazier won by 15-round unanimous decision, a win that included that iconic 14th-round knockdown of Ali with the trademark Frazier left hook. It's kind of hard to quantify today how big this event was back then. But, Mike, what were the elements that that made it so special? Well, I just wrote a 2,500-word story for uh, the ring magazine so it's all pretty fresh in my mind uh and i went back and watched it again too it it was just an enormous event um it is kind of hard to put into words uh the fight itself was massive i mean you had two unbeaten former olympic gold medalists who had legitimate claims on the heavyweight title remember ali had been stripped of his titles and lost his boxing license when he refused induction into the army um, and after which he was out of boxing for three and a half years. Yeah. Uh, and there was a lot of upheaval in the country at the time, including um, you know, racial issues and uh, anti-Vietnam War movement. Uh, and Ali, of course, became a symbol of that movement, while Frazier, who was like an apolitical guy, he just wasn't political at all, somehow became the symbol of the establishment. Uh, and so they took that political divide into the ring with them. You know, which combined with the fight itself just whipped the whole country into a frenzy. You know, half the people were rooting for Ali, the other half were for Frazier. It was just, there was just tons of celebrities at the event. Frank Sinatra was hired to shoot the fight for for Life magazine. I could just go on and on and on. And it was just like a one of a kind event. It certainly was. I mean, see, everybody, everybody's been talking about it in the boxing world and outside the boxing world. What did that victory mean for Joe Frazier? Uh, 
Well, the fight was an opportunity for him to prove that he deserved to be called champion, uh, even though he already won the title in the ring, actually sort of won it twice. He had to win two fights to to sort of become undisputed champion. But even then, he wasn't undisputed because Ali, uh, the specter of Ali hung over him. You know, some people still thought, hey, nobody took Ali's title from him in the ring. Um, you got to beat Ali before we call you champion. Uh, and so Frazier had to do that to win universal recognition. And uh, to, so to say he was motivated is like a gross understatement. You know, he was just on fire in that fight. He was just locked in, fierce as, as he's ever been in his entire career. And he ended up having his hand raised. And after that fight, there was no there was no controversy. Now, obviously, this was the biggest fight of uh, Ali's career. Well, up to that point, post layoff. Was it the same version, the same Ali from 1967 that that Frazier fought in the ring that night? No, uh, not from my perspective. He wasn't quite as quick, quite as athletic as he was uh, in the early part of his career. I mean, the the early version of, of Ali might have been the greatest fighter of all time, um, and you could see you could see in the in the fight of the century that he wasn't quite the same. He fought more flat footed that he had than he had earlier in his career. Um, listen, I should be careful here though, because Ali was still quicker and more athletic than anybody else, including Frazier. Right. He just wasn't quite the fighter, uh, quite that, the didn't have quite the quickness, wasn't quite the athlete that he was early on. But but he made up for for that with with uh, his ring IQ, his guile. I mean, nobody had guile like him. And, and, and an underrated part of him was this unbelievably tough, durable guy, too. Um, and and don't and don't take my don't take my word for it in terms of that that he had slipped a little bit in terms of what I was describing before. I asked Angelo Dundee about that once, and he told me one on one, and I'm quoting him: "Muhammad lost his best years as a boxer when he went away." So we I can believe that. Yeah, we did not see uh, the best, and it's kind of scary to think of because how great he was, but we did not see the best Muhammad Ali. The years he was away from boxing should have been his best his best years. Why do you think Frazier was unable to to duplicate? what he did in that first fight in the rematch now, i mean the third fight was brutal but that part in that rematch what changed why why was front fraser unable to to beat ali well first the second and third fights were still competitive so it wasn't right. as if as if he wasn't uh, you know in the fight in the second and third fights um i always thought that ali was a little rusty when he fought fraser the first time um he'd been again he'd been away for a long time and he only had two fights before the fight of the century so maybe that's enough to to shed the rust maybe it's not um i think he looked a lot better in terms of the way he moved in the second fight uh plus frazier knew how to fight in one way you know bobbing weaving plowing straight ahead you know winging that left hook that's yeah. who he was that's who he was he wasn't going to change ali was a <clears throat> excuse me ali was a really smart fighter he had a better idea of what he was up against uh, in the second fight and the third fight and made some adjustments, I think. One thing he did was move a little bit more. Uh, I thought his timing was better. Uh, he beat Frazier to the punch more often in the second fight. And very importantly, I thought this was a key. He clinched a lot when Frazier got close to him in the second yeah, fight. Yeah. So sort of just tied him up and didn't let him do as much. And it worked. You know, he won the fight. In the third fight, you, you just sort of alluded to this, the thrill in Manila. That was just a battle of attrition. It was like... Whomever could take more torture would emerge victorious, <laughs> and that and that was Ali. We don't usually talk about his will and his toughness, uh, but again, he was just loaded with those qualities. I wanted to mention one real a personal uh, experience that I had, and I was a little kid uh, when the first fight happened, um, but I do remember it. I remember the excitement, uh, even though I was just a school kid. Um, I didn't know a thing about boxing, but I but I, Ali was just bigger than life. Even then, yeah. he was big. He's bigger than life. I remember talking about the fight with the other kids. Everybody was really excited, talking about it uh, for days and days. And wow. I remember I I actually bet a kid um, that Ali would win. I had Ali, and he had Frazier. I think I think I bet a dollar, which to me was a lot of money at the time. And the little swindler evidently knew more about boxing than I did because he because he because he, he won the, he won he the bet. Uh, I don't know. I should find him and and I can now I know more than about boxing than him. I'm sure I could probably make some money. Oh goodness, that's a great great story. I mean, hopefully we see more big fights like that in, in boxing's present and um, and in the future. Now with that. Let's jump right into the PBC fight of the week. It's a symphony of percussion. Oh, what a onslaught by Benavidez. Two-time former champion David Benavidez. He could be a megastar. Takes on Ronald Ellis in a super middleweight clash. Ellis has the look of a guy possessed. Plus Isaac Cruz fresh off of one of 2020's biggest knockouts. 
Saturday, March 13th. This Saturday, March 13th, PBC Boxing returns to the Mohegan Sun for another triple header live on Showtime Championship Boxing beginning at 9 p.m. Eastern time in the main event. Undefeated two-time super middleweight world champion David Benavides takes on Ronald Ellis to WBC world super middleweight title eliminator. So a lot is on the line for Mr. Benavides, and we're going to start with the essentials. Okay, here we go. Benavides, 23-0, 20 knockouts. Ellis is 18-1-2 with 12 knockouts. Obviously, Benavides is 5-0 in his last five with three KOs. Ellis, 4-1 with two KOs. Uh, Benavides last fought in this past August. He knocked out Romer Angulo in 10 rounds. Ellis was in the ring December. Uh, he stopped Matt Korobov. If you remember, Korobov uh, injured his ankle and had to quit. Uh, Benavides has one of the best uh, knockout ratios in the sport, 87%. Uh, Ellis, 55. Similar number of rounds, 97 for Benavides, 92 for Ellis. Uh, Benavides is only 24, Ellis 31. Benavides turned pro in 2013, uh, Ellis in 2011. They both fight from an orthodox stance. Uh, Benavides has a height advantage, 6'1 and a half to 5'10 and a half. They both have a 77 inch reach, so uh, Ellis has long arms. Uh, Benavides is from Phoenix, and Ellis is from Lynn, Massachusetts. Oh, I mean, looking at what you just said. Clearly, Benavides is the favorite. But let's talk about the underdog, Ronald Ellis. He does have some good traits on paper. You mentioned the reach. How good of a chance does he have to score an upset? Not good uh, from my perspective. Uh, he could be competitive, though. Ellis is a good all-around fighter, good seasoned boxer, good athlete. He's got some power. Um, that said, I, I just don't think he does anything special enough to beat a guy like Benavides, who I think is a legitimate threat to Canelo Alvarez, to sort of put this into perspective. Ellis is a good fighter. Benavides is a special fighter. He certainly has the p- potential to be a truly special fighter. He's just a big, strong, talented, sort of mean-spirited guy who just beats the hell out of you. That's who he is. Yeah, he's obviously a great fighter in the ring. But he's lost his titles twice now for circumstances outside the ring. Once, you know, for testing positive for drugs. And then after regaining it, he lost it on the scales last August. Now, based on that, some people say Benavidez is just just doesn't have the discipline to become to fulfill his his potential. What's your take? Well, I guess we'll see. Um, he's had two slip ups. He failed a drug test and he came in overweight against, uh, before the Angulo fight. And that cost him his title two times. Uh, we have to remember how young he is. You know, he told us that he learned from the first slip up. Uh, and I want to cut him a little bit of slack for missing weight, uh, given the pandemic, although professionals just can't do that. Um, this is, this is their job after all. It just can't happen. I mean, I hope he's learned that lesson, um, after, uh, failing, failing one time. Uh, all that said, he's had quite a bit of success for being so undisciplined. So he's got it. Certainly has a lot of discipline. Uh, and he strikes me as the he strikes me as the kind of kid who wants to mature. He wants to evolve. He wants to get better. Uh, so I got to think he'll make fewer and fewer mistakes as he moves forward. I think he's destined to overcome these these things and become uh, a special fighter, as I said earlier. Yeah, I do. I do too. And from what I hear, the uh, the birth of his baby boy last year has has changed right. him a bit. Uh, he looks great, you know, in the photos I've seen on social media. But hey, look, we've seen some strange things happen in the ring over the last year. Do you see an upset here, or are you going with Benavides? I'm going to go on a limb and go with Benavides. Uh, Whatever. I th- I think Ellis is, again is is a good enough boxer to give Benavides some problems, maybe early in the fight. Uh, but Benavides is just going to keep coming and coming and coming. And there won't be anything Ellis, Ellis can do about it in the long run. I think Benavides is going to break him down and stop him around the seventh or eighth round, maybe a little bit later. Uh, but I don't think it's going to go the distance. Yeah, I'm going with Benavides as well. I, again, like I said, he looks like he's in fantastic shape. And I think he's looking to make a statement. I don't see it, you know, going the distance either. I don't expect this one to go beyond eight rounds, as a matter of fact. So we're we're in agreement there. Now, the co-feature may not last the distance either. A 12-round lightweight bout between Isaac Cruz and Matias Romero. Mike, there was an article on the Premier Boxing Champions website last week listing five PBC fighters who could break out in 2020. 21 Isaac Cruz was among that five how good is he 
Well, I think he's more fun to watch than he is good, but I also think he's good. Uh, in other words, what I'm trying to say is I know for sure that he's fun to watch. There's no doubt in my mind. I think it's sort of the jury's still out as to how good he's going to be. Um, I th- if you want a comparison, I think he's a better, maybe a much better version of James Kirkland, a guy who wanted to knock his opponent's head off with every single punch that he threw. Uh, that's pretty much who Cruz you know, is uh, his knockout of Diego Magdaleno in October was about as brutal of 53 seconds as you're ever going to see uh, in the prize ring. Uh, you know, but before that, he barely won a decision over Thomas Matisse. Uh, we're going to have to wait and see how he does against the next level uh, opponent. Uh, the only thing I know for sure is uh, he's either going to win or he's going to go down swinging. Uh, and to answer your, your question directly, I, I, I think he's, really has a, a lot of potential. I think he's going to be a very good fighter, but but it's just going to be a wild ride no matter what happens. Yeah, absolutely. He's 22. There's still time for him to refine any technical deficiencies he might have, but the the rest of it he certainly possesses. Now, a lot of people may not know his opponent, Matias Romero. What can you tell us about him? He's a 24-year-old from Argentina. He looks like a good boxer, a good athlete. He knows how to knows how to box, knows moves pretty well. Uh, doesn't have much power. I'm basing that more on his record than anything else, but I, I think that's the case. Uh, he's fought outside South America only one time, and that was in Mexico four years ago. So this is a big deal for him, uh, you know, to, to come here and to, and and fight Cruz. Um, I think he's going to look like he belongs in the ring with Cruz until he doesn't, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I I, I know exactly what you mean, and given what you know. What kind of fight can fans expect on Saturday night? That's going to be a blast. I mean, that's that's Cruz. It's going to be no matter what happens, it's going to be fun to watch. And I think we I think we know it's going to happen. You know, yet the the is the way he attacked Magdaleno works so well in his previous fight. I got to think he's going to try to do that again. He's just going to like dangerous sp- though. Sprint across the ring and just start waiting. Well. I don't think against this guy it's dangerous. That's the thing. I think he's going to sprint across the ring and just go after the guy. Um, you know, no matter what happens, fans are going to be entertained. Uh, as I said, Cruz just doesn't hold back. Uh, he'll stalk Romero from the opening bell. He's not going to stop until the fight's over. And your prediction? I just don't see Romero standing up to that kind of pressure. Uh, you know, Cruz is just going to throw bombs from the opening bell once again. Uh, Romero probably will avoid, maybe even take a few punches, but some of them are going to land, and he's going to get hurt at some point. And I think that point's going to come early in the fight. I don't see this fight lasting more than three rounds. Yeah, mm. I don't. I'm with you. I don't see it lasting more than five rounds. Although I'd like to see Cruz extend it a bit more, see if he can keep up that intensity. But whatever happens, I expect him to to finish the job, no matter how long it goes. Now, also in the televised opener, a pretty evenly matched bout between Super Well Two H, Jamonte Clark, and Terrell Gauche. That's a ten rounder. And in our prediction league, we're you know. Close to neck and neck. I'm still in first at six one and one. Mike is five two and one. And with that, let's bring in our guest this week. He has been at the top of the sport for a very long time now, and he doesn't look to be slowing down anytime soon. Some of you may know him as Big Mel. He's the WBA, WBC, IBF World Super World to a champion, Jermel Iron Man Charlo. Jamal, first things first, how are you and your family doing? I mean, we, we're great. I mean, me and my family, I mean, life life is amazing. And I mean I I mean, for a boxer coming from where we come from and seeing how where we at and sometimes you take a reflection, you look over, you know, you know, sometimes you gotta appreciate that question and I and I do. That's that's one thing that I work for. So yeah, life is a good, family's amazing, everything's straight. Yeah, that that's great to hear. You know, uh, I know there was so much that happened in in Texas as far as the snow and the power outages. Were, were you affected by any of that at all? No, I um I, I prepared for that stuff like a while ago. I never yeah. had that issue. Yeah. Wow. I'm ahead of the game. Mm. Facts. Very, very good, Jamel. We missed the ringside with the Lion Show on YouTube. Do you have any new shows planned? Um, yeah, so, so keep it like I'm going to be dropping it. I was going to talk about that a little bit. Um, glad y'all asked. I, I, I'm, um, I had to take a break from the rings out with the Lions. Um, but you know, we back on, I'm, I'm a, I redone some things, reorganized some things. So, um, you know, every show got to have a concept, every show got to have a purpose and a reason, you know, just letting people in your, your life just so they can make a personal comment. It's stupid. So at the end of the day, you you, you know, you want to, I want to push for something, but 
you know, just to get back in the swing of things, we're going to just open it back up and just take off again. But um, I'm glad that, you know, people are, folks are paying attention to it. it you know, it's a, it's a channel that, that let people see the inside world of, you know, some things that we do. Great. Um, obviously, there's been some movement in the 154-pound division lately. <clears throat> Brian Castaño is now the uh, the new WBO 154-pound champ. Did you get a chance to watch his win over Patrick Teixeira? Um, you know, I think I've seen some highlights you know, of just a few rounds. I haven't watched the whole fight. You know, we'll tune into that when it, when it, when the time comes. We catch these guys off of, uh, you know, unconsciousness when they think they it's time to, you know, relax and hang out or whatever they got to be doing with catch them. It's time, it's time to get back in there. They're not prepared. So, um, this is my division. I control it now. So I, I feel like, you know, they, I, I got, I got the respect I deserve in my division. It's just mostly the world of boxing. that kind of just still kind of rocky with the Charlos. Um, and the good thing is that, you know, in creating shows like the ringside, the lines, they can separate to see the difference between us, but you know, uh, I'm handling my business outside the ring, inside the ring, but um, Castano, He's just uh, uh, another champion that, that, you know, I've been through some tough fights. I'm, I'm a dog in this thing, and I, I, I love this world. I love this boxing, and I and, and I try my best to, you know, adapt to uh, adapt to boxing, adapt to boxing. Um, you know, I try I try my best to adapt to, to, to how they move, but, you know, I can't. You know, I'm in my own lane, and I do my own thing. And when I, when this, this division right now is mine, and I feel like, uh, you know, I got some tough competition. I see it. We pay attention, but uh, they know what where they line up at. <clears throat> they know where they line up at. They know where they exist. You know, I'm talking to him, and I don't talk to these people's managers and promoters. So they got a lot of people that run these shows and how they run their camps and stuff like that. They they just all talk. You you mentioned adapting, and mm-hmm. not just outside the ring, but inside the ring. You've shown a lot of you know. You, you've got different styles, different things, little, little tricks you got in your in your bag. When you see Castaño, wh- what are your thoughts on him as a fighter? Um, well, I mean, every fighter has, you know, two arms, two legs, a body, and a, a mental. Um, Castaño is another fighter where you get in there, you look at it, you compare certain things, and it's just like um, – he, he, you know, he, he a regular fight. He gonna come to put pressure. He gonna, he not gonna bag up. He gonna lunge in with every shot. He one fifty four, so he my weight division. He gonna throw some shots at you. He gonna throw some. It's just uh, you know, when you throw when I when I'm wrong to throw such a sneaky powerful shot, different things. It's just like wait, will he be prepared for those things? I told y'all same thing was you know Rosario. He's strong. Yeah, he did, knocking boys out. He, you know, I heard all these interviews from. Um, <clears throat> Nate and Gallimore and J Rock and J Rock's old trainer saying did this and this and that, and I'm just like, wow! I heard this after the fight, you know. I'm like, wow! I can't believe they even thought like that, because you know, coming from how I do this thing in the era of boxing that I really, I'm really from, you know, that's the thing about me and my brother. We really from a whole different era of boxing. We just in this new era. It, you know, who knows when the time going around with this, but we we some of the last of the dying breeds of the dogs that they had in this thing. So um, until y'all political people change it up, you know, as y'all been doing, and I say y'all because I'm talking y'all media people, anybody that's yeah. listening to it as media, y'all changed this game up so much. But y'all really, uh, you know, the way me and the Charlos, the Charlos, period, y'all can't, we can't lose the respect that we get. So anyway, once we get it, it's on. Um, yeah, you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Castano ain't, he, like I said, another man, when he, just another, when, when he get in there is, you know, he did good against a guy that was tall, that, you know, wasn't relentless at all, wasn't ruthless with the punching man, wasn't, didn't train to me for a fight that could be at the caliber to fight me. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, he talked a whole lot of game. Maybe it was to boost up the fight that he had, I guess it's mandatory or whatever. But, you know, uh, not to mention, there's other guys in the division. Because I'm not just the only guy that to fight. You know, it's other guys, it's an easy division to make a lot of money in if you're at the top. So, uh, you know, who knows if he even the next fight, you know, I'm just throwing it out there because you told me about the WBO champion and I got all the other belts. So it don't matter. We can only talk about me. So what else? I mean, what's popping? Well, he he said that he wants you and you just say you're not sure if oh, that fight is next or. Of course. No, listen, 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 don't get it <laughs> twisted. You heard what I said. Uh, you already heard what I said. I already told right. you that I, I, I'm. I, 
it's clear what I, I'm a animal and I want all these, excuse me, man, for you give me all Feel like, free. Feel I free. See how people, I see how people could easily change things up. No, I want everybody, I want to smash Kastana, I want to get him out the way. I see him, he fought Arizona Law. We know all about him. We know what's up. Mm. We ain't tripping on that. We just understood that Castano ain't, you know, there's other guys too. You know what I'm saying? And I ain't overlooking none of these people. So, but all, you know, obviously he got the belt. Obviously that's what's next. Obviously that's what we want. Obviously that we're going to make it one of the biggest things that happened for unification or undisputed titles, everything that's popping in the vision. That's what they wanted. All the belts are one. Same dream Canelo got. He want to be undisputed. Of course. That's, right. my, that's like, that's, we can't, you know, <clears throat> oh, yeah. So, you're no stranger to unifications. You unified against Rosario, which you were just talking about with that knockout win. Um, do you feel he might never recovered from that knockdown in the sixth round, the left hook to the head? Yeah, he went to sleep back in the corner. And go back and watch the fight. He dazed off a little bit. He ain't recovered anything. I could have, wish I would have came out there and did like a spin turnaround. How you get punched or something <laughs> made it look like wow, Jamil is power is ridiculous. Yeah, he was done. He got back up. It's probably his oxygen to his brain and his legs. They wasn't flowing the same whenever he sat down because of the fact that he went right back to the stool and sat down. You know, most of the times when you knock these guys out, well, I'm you know I've been knocking guys out, so I understand. And I watch them when they get up, and I've been watching them when they get up since I was younger, and they never the same when they get up. So at least give him some time. When he got in, after that one minute of just sitting down, he at least needed to stand up for 10 seconds. <clears throat> I don't think he was even there. But, of course, any boxer that's a warrior, uh, he a dog, he's going to come keep fighting. You know, he knew was to bang his gloves and just keep coming. But whatever happened, the body didn't respond the same. And um, I, I accepted my victory because I put the work in throughout the other rounds and everything else that other people that were fighting him couldn't do. So, so usually when you get a knockout, the crowd goes completely nuts. In this case, there was no crowd. Was it kind of strange? What was that like? I heard my twin brother. My twin brother was oh. turned up. We were straight. We had the bubble the whole time together. That was our show. It was amazing to see my brother happy, tears about to fall down his eyes. He just won his big fight, got a big life check. We both big living, big living, everything. We came back home happy. It was cool. It was great. I had that was a great celebration. Sometimes when crowds be mad at you still, they throw chairs at you. <laughs> sometimes don't even need the crowd. Sometimes that's the best experience you can have. Just y'all together, something that we've been doing together since we were younger. <clears throat> what what does it feel like to to see the the fruits of your labor? Uh, you know, you mentioned that you're from uh, a different school. You're, you're basically, you know, you guys are the last of the Mohicans to 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 be here at this level and to be doing what what you do. How does that feel? <clears throat> Let me let me and um, um, and give you a little bit of elaboration and detail on when I say the last of the dying breed. We talking like <clears throat> the warrior, it's like like you know Kawasaki, Joe Kawasaki. You know the warriors like Edwin Valero. The warriors like Vernon Forrest. We talking like that era. I watched it ran on the side of the Mario Augusta on the treadmill and just wow. seeing how he did it himself. Ankle weights on his wrist, ankle weights down on his neck, his ankles everywhere chilling and just living no headphones on i ain't running with headphones on i want to see and hear cars i'm like that on the bike i don't want it so i i've I, I kind of like learned so many things and put this into and adapt this into my world and certain things and watch it and the holy feeling how he unite his camp and how he used camp to be what really helped win a whole bunch of his fights but you know the person that i am it's not a lot of these people that's in his era of boxing these guys on instagram these guys all over the world how to live for their families they got a, you know, the real life. A lot of people are just overlooking it right now. <clears throat> but anyway, it- I'm the one that we last are some of the dying ones. You know, we come in, we come in the way we come in. That's just how it is. You know, you can't go in there and talk crazy to us and expect to get a handshake later. I mean, I, I can't forget. You know, I know they say forgive and turn out the cheek, and I just can't do that all the time. And, and with all of these people that's in this world of boxing, I got to defend. I'm a warrior. So that's why I tied a Bruce Lee on my neck. Now, is, is, um, you you mentioned what you said that 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 old school mentality, and you also talked about other 154 pounders. You had some some bad blood with with Tony Harrison when you guys were um, when you guys fought. Obviously, you you got the best of that. But is he someone you would consider fighting again? Looking at at the other names, or he over he over with he out of there. He got to bounce back. I knocked him out. 
Not tomorrow, do I yeah. can't keep hearing Tony Harrison years ago. I don't even really play the moment. <laughs> we on the submission. We just draw Rosario to really knock the code out. That was dope. Like, you know what I'm saying? These guys still box. I fought some studs. I fought all those minor roses. You know, I yeah. had beef with all these dudes. That is not Lou, but not B. Hadley. He was a stud in the division when he was coming in the game. Everybody talked to, though. Everybody act like, you know, like they forgot. You know, all of a sudden, I'll tell y'all what it is. Wants to, to, you know, I pop up out of nowhere and give y'all a quick interview. Let's check in with the Charlos. What's up with Jamil? Nah, I ain't mad about nothing. Nah, I don't got issues. And I don't got no person. I mean, I'm a boxer. I mean, I must turn up in the end. Hell yeah. I mean, <laughs> we all got problems. I mean, I got attitude problems I worked on since I was younger. And then developed into the man that I am, but I'm still better in myself. Don't play with me or sorry guys who listen inside. Don't you know, I'm trying to be a better man, but I, you know, sometimes you get tested in this world it do that to you. So but I am the Charlo that's turned up the different when I'm the stud and one knocking everybody out. I am that guy. I talk it, I bag it up, I make them keep running their mouth and, and then I go do my thing. Is it different? To, and then it's been a while actually since you've been in, in, in this you've been in this position for a long time now but you you've seen both sides of the fence is it different be, being the hunter as opposed to the one that everyone is hunting I'm still, uh, I mean if they not hunting they they trying to hunt my legacy this is dog in me this they ain't trying to hunt did they did they not just trying to hunt just because of the belts and stuff they don't care about that they want their livelihood and all of that so when they put that up i'm gonna make them put theirs i'm gonna, when they make me put mine up i'm gonna put, make them put theirs up that's gonna be forever in this game so it's not i, I can't really answer that question i'm a, you see where i stand yeah you haven't lost the hunger at all yeah i don't know when i'm supposed to <laughs> that's right <laughs> Now there's we talk about the 154 pound division. There's a there's one up and coming fighter, uh, Sebastian Fundura. I don't I'm not sure he's ready for you just yet. But but what are your thoughts on him as a fighter? I mean, uh, you want to see something almost similar to like an Aaron Wolf knockout, um, and you put him in there with somebody like me. And if you don't, you want to keep building him, make him fight. He's tall, lanky. He's doing his thing. He's developing to a young fighter that he is. I've seen him hyping him up. They compared him to me and all of this stuff. But please, he's not, he was not even, you know, I don't know how many fights I got left in my career, but I, I, I don't see him, okay? Period. Yeah. Right. Uh, we had uh, Jarrett Hurd on the on the podcast. Obviously, he said he wants a crack at you. Uh, it would still be a big but, fight. Is that something you'd be interested in? Well, I mean, he took a lot of the, the money that was worth the fight away from it from whenever they didn't want to accept the fight when I asked for it. But because uh, they didn't want Jamil Charlo to run boxing, like I told them a long time ago, Lions only run boxing in my division. Um, and that was the makeup problem that he had. He took that little fight and then he ended up taking the J-Rock fight, which was, uh, I think, a mandatory at that time. So it's just like, hey, you know, I can't, I don't see him. I, I can't, I don't see him. He's not. He's far away. You know what I mean. He 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 got to work his way back up. He he been on a layoff. He had surgeries and stuff like that. You know, I ain't putting no incisions in my body. But yeah, man, I do all that stuff after if I need it. In the meantime, we walk. We working. Got it. Um, how easy is it for you to make 154 these days? How much longer do you see yourself staying in the in the division? Mostly till I retire from this boxing. I don't Rainers. know. Um, I know there's there's guys that need this position in spots, and um, you know, I, I don't know why I'm not the linear franchise champion belt and all this thing arriving at my house. Finally got my IBF. Shout out to them for sending that belt. So it took a little time, but I know Jeez. I got everything at the house, the hall where I'm gonna eventually take a picture with it. Might do it today. Who knows? But you know, I I, I don't know, dog. My 50, 154 is where I'm at. You know what I mean? That's where I'm, where I'm at. I don't care. I, 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 my brother at 160. Earl Spence at 147. As long as Earl Spence can hold it down at 147, that's that's my stable mate. That's my that, that's uh, never gonna happen. If for anyone that's asking dumb questions that Earl okay. Spence fight me and all of that can never happen. I'm mean, 154. Um, he 147. My brother 160. We holding it down the Texas way. Um, and if we busting heads all over the country. You know what I'm saying? Pineapple to Big Apple to the red apple we didn't fought all of them all three of us and we all pay-per-view stars now we fought on pay-per-view i don't care if it's a star or not next to it but it's pay-per-view so that's big an accomplishment by itself but you know um we'll shuffle around we'll see how we move 
You, you mentioned Texas. This might be the most dominating run for Texas fighters in history now that I think about it. Do you take pride in no, that? It's like Texas is so independent, right? Like all over America, we're independent on the other Right, right, we're right. We're everywhere, right? We're independent in this box. We're holding it down in Texas. That's, that's <laughs> you, awesome. Sorry, you know, you, they just got some fighters. Russia got some fighters. Them places got fighters, but they up against Char- they up against the Charles and the Earl them at the, in the middle weight, in the middle class weight division. All right. Uh, right. Looking at looking at your resume, I mean, mm-hmm. we spoke about Rosario, we spoke about Harrison. You mentioned Cotto, Trout, Lubin, Hatley, Vonis Rosen, who you mentioned. What are what are your thoughts when you you don't see your name on a pound for pound list after everything that you've accomplished? Well, I mean, um, the great thing about me is because I'm an animal and I'm a dog and I want to keep that hunger and that fire. It's just, so it's okay. You know, like at the end of the day, I'm okay with them not giving me the recognition that I deserve because, um, but at the end of the day, I don't know who is operating those things. I don't know who making up this list. It's not a union in this sport. We all want to, everybody trying to hustle and these bloggers, all these people, at the end of the day, it's all about what you feed your world into my life. And my personal internal life is not surrounded amongst this world. And that's a worldly thing to me, you know, rankings and stuff. I don't even know who in the rankings. Like, I just know my weight division, where I domain and where I territorize that. I know who in the top and I know who, what they doing. I go to boxing. I love boxing. I just went to the Canelo fight. I go, I watch the, the rail fight. I, I mean, I support the hell out of boxing. Carissa Shields just did her thing, you know. Her facts and papers are 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 why she can hoop and holler all over the world. I hope she get a bigger fight and her opportunity in the world one day. You yeah. know what I mean? But you know, because it's, it's due. You know, women deserve that today. Women's rights, the Women's Day recognition day. Right. But anyways, listen. Um, we are gonna move on from that. You know, we we we'll care. We're okay with that. Y'all heard me. It, it make me hungry. Mm. You. You're the king of 154. You say you want to be there mm-hmm. for a while. Aside from Errol, do you see any of the other 147 pounders coming up and, and challenging you? Oh, any of God. them? They got some guys in there. Um, you know, I got people in my camp and people in my team. We doctors at this stuff. We scientists at this stuff. So uh, they'll come up. A lot of people will be moving weight. They'll lose and try to find a new rebounds. But honestly, if we're going to rock it the way I've been rocking it and I'm an old school guy, I'm not going to go and let these people come in this division and think they go come from the top from over there and come up to the top. That's like disrespectful to the guys. That's, and if they want to get in there and get it mixed up in the top tunnels, jump at one of them guys. I don't know if a lot of guys would be able to take some of these top guys that we got because we got some killers in. Yeah. Yeah. You've been a professional for 14 years now. What would you say you've learned the most about this game? Um, That's a great question, man. I've I've learned so many different things. I learned generation and change, and I learned so many. You know, I I learned. You know, one of the best things that I learned in this game is like stand stand down. Is 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 okay, but being a, being a, being on your own as your own independent is amazing. Like it's better, and that's what that's what help a lot of fighters when they get stuck into this mental of loyalty of because of like long, but they getting treated bad the whole time. That's what messes boxing up. You know, I once was a young fighter. I had, was shot, signed by Shelly Finkel. And the problem with my fight, my, me getting signed to anything is because Ronnie Shields and Savannah was beefing over who was going to train Juan Diaz and Holyfield at the time. So Ronnie Shields said, I'm training Holyfield, which was a bigger bag. But Juan Diaz was mm. fighting for his world title. So I ended up getting with Ronnie and his crew. And boom, back on Shelly Finkel. He opened the door for me. Shelly introduced me to Golden Boy. I got with Golden Boy. Shelly left me. I'm all alone. No management. Just a promoter. I still go along this world by myself. Then I ended up getting with Mr. Al Heyman, and that was the next thing that I ever done. Lose a promoter, don't no more promoter, and I just been rocking that way, and I got my own. But and I think that's the best way to go because a lot of fighters, when they grow up, they don't really understand. They lose, they focus, focus and conscious on what was their project, and that was to supply for their family. How you gonna do that? Trying to be loyal to this guy, he only been paying you chump change, and you got the god honest given talent, uh, like Andrade. You know, get great talent, but just not making the bread that he got. Because in the bread, sometimes to me, they talent be worth all these millions of dollars floating around. And then you got YouTubes and different people coming out of the game that think they got the skills and stuff, and they able to do what they got to do only because they got the marketing behind them, they got the right people behind them, they did their business right. And they, hey, I commend anybody that decides that they want to get in this ring and be a warrior. All right, you stepped in the ring, you did it. That's your fault. 
So you see that a lot in the game right now in, in boxing in terms of um, a lot of the younger boxers coming up, I mean, do you, uh, that, that get with certain promoters or do certain things. Do you see a lot of – do you wish you could advise some of these guys? I just gave them all the I gave I just dropped some gems on them right there. I mean, I yeah. can't I wish I'm not here to advise them, you know, I'm a boxer, I'm not I'm a be I'm a promoter as well, but you know, even as a promoter, like it's it's all about me. Hey, business is business. I'm not trying to steal nothing from you. You bring this to me, I'm gonna bring this to you. You give me one hundred, I'm gonna give you one hundred back. And that's just how the game should always be. You know, it's not about like what they can if you can't pr- produce a big crowd and you can't make this and this happen for me, how can I expect just the, a lot of them be wanting all of this big bread. And I mean, but hey, look, keep the, I, I, as a fighter, I mean, I was once a hungry fighter too, wanting the money, wanting the bag, wanting the big fight. So I, I mean, it, I have to work in both ways, but you just got to do it the way you, you know, stay loyal, but don't forget about yourself. And that's why, that's why I spoke on it. Mm. You, you kind of just led us to our last question. We watched the last uh, Ringside with the Lion show, and it's obvious that loyalty is very important to you in terms of your family and your inner circle and so forth. How do you apply that on the business side? Is it the same way in, in terms of business? I mean, loyalty in business is mostly um, similar to what I spoke on, too, you know, like, you know, you, you can't have your feelings tied up in it. You know, if you and your feelings go to the dentist. That's my. That's what I say. You know, we can't be in our feelings about stuff. So, uh, business is that way with me. Family is that way with me. I mean, was that the real question that you're trying to ask? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Because in boxing, I mean, with you know, you've been loyal to your team in boxing. Obviously, you have you have your relationship with with Al and 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 with Derek and and Errol and and so forth. But it's we know the sport is so is so wild. It's so dirty. How do you how do you maneuver? You just um you 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 gotta have like you know like it uh, that's okay I could I could I could you relate to that question, you know you know one time you know I was on the podium, Tony Harrison tried to throw out a slug saying oh I talked to deer he said deer yeah yeah he just here for this I'm like I looked at my coach and it's like that's when you gotta like you're a man like we you know what's up already we don't gotta speak on that you know what I mean like it then but we still spoke on it but like man that dude is just trying to boom 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 but that's you know you just gotta stick with your people. Yeah. Whoever you whoever you rock with, y'all just go to the top together. That's it. Well, Why you and they want to be the other people. They want to be the next man. They want to be this guy. So they be all over the place, jumping everywhere. Well, I I don't know who's got next, but we know you've got now. So Jamal, thank you for 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 coming on the PBC podcast. We appreciate it as always. We can't wait to see you uh, back in the ring. We're hoping you get a, a date soon. We hope we hear an announcement soon. Well, I mean, just we'll be back. You know, I don't. We ain't never went nowhere. Just hopefully, when we come back, we get a great audience and you know, put on the show for the fans. And we dip, dip like we do all the time, I guess, since that's what they say. All right, man. Appreciate this phone call. Rings out with the lines, y'all. Keep it locked. Check in on YouTube with that. Twin Charlo on um, Instagram. Shout out to my brother, them Future Boxing, and they they world over there. They doing their thing. Um, we'll all be seeing each other soon in this boxing. Thank world. you, man. Thanks, take, Jamal. Take care. I appreciate it, PPC. It's a symphony of percussion. Oh, what an onslaught by Benavidez. Two-time former champion David Benavidez. He could be a megastar. Takes on Ronald Ellis in a super middleweight clash. Ellis has the look of a guy possessed. Plus, Isaac Cruz fresh off of one of 2020's biggest knockouts. Saturday, March 13th. It's time for Mike and I to go toe to toe. Every week we go back and forth over a topic or two. And this week we're going to look at five past fights and ask ourselves, pound for pound, prime for prime, who would have won? And what that means is if both fighters were in their prime and and pound for pound, all things being equal, who would have won that first matchup? We're going to start one with one that's been a hot topic on social media. In September 2013, Floyd Money Mayweather moved up to super welterweight and easily outpointed Canelo Alvarez, was at a catch weight of 152 pounds. With the win, Mayweather became a unified champion at both welter and super welterweight at the same time. Alvarez was only 23, and many feel that now that he's 30 years old, He's a far better fighter than he was then. So we ask, prime for pound, prime for prime, and also pound for pound, since they were both at their best in different weights, who would win, Floyd Mayweather or Canelo Alvarez? You're asking me. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mayweather would never have lost to Canelo. Uh, that, that's no knock on Canelo, uh, who was still, as you mentioned, who was still developing as a boxer when he fought Mayweather. Uh, and he went in with a terrible game plan, I think, too. They, they tried to box with Mayweather, which just made no sense to me at all. Um, he's a much better fighter now, as you said, particularly defensively. Uh, here's the thing, though. He just isn't in Mayweather's class. As good as he is, he's not in Mayweather's class. Yeah. Uh, what can he do? Okay, we're looking at them prime in their primes, uh, pound for pound. What could he do better than Mayweather? The only thing he could do better is, is punch harder. Uh, but Canelo wouldn't have been able to touch uh, a prime Mayweather, you know, you know, yeah, it's, when we think of Mayweather now, we think of him later in his career, go back a little bit. He was a lot better when he was younger. I mean, if that's even possible, he was a lot better when he was younger. I don't think Canelo could have touched that version. I scored the actual Mayweather Canelo fight 120 to 108, which wow. is a shutout. Uh, I would predict uh, a fight between them and their prime pound for pound 118, 110 for, for Mayweather. I don't think it would have been close. Yeah. Bet the house on money. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree with you. I mean, I think he wins. I think he wins a, a decision in a decent scrap. Um, 10, 10, 2, 9, 3, 8 to 4, d- whatever, whatever it is, he's going to win decisively. I mean, he was just too good defensively. And you mentioned the younger Mayweather, the one who fought Gotti, the one who fought. Juan Manuel Marquez, that guy, pound for pound. I don't know how you beat him. I mean, he could fight on the inside. On the outside, he had the power to stand inside and trade. Excellent in-fighter, sublime defense, You know, great footwork, ridiculous ring IQ, uh, a warrior's heart. I mean, I think he's a level above a guy like Canelo, who's a great fighter in his own right. But as we saw years ago, just, just not in the Mayweather class. And I think it's highly unlikely that you see anyone beat Canelo ever the way Floyd did that night. Yeah, it's just as good as Canelo is Mayweather's at the next. I think, and, and I'm not sure Canelo even has the right style. I think you need to have, I'm just going to pull this out of my hat, like a guy like an Aaron Pryor, who's just literally just all over Mayweather. You know, it's sort of what we saw with Castillo and sort of what we saw with, with Maidana, but like a better version than that. Right. That, that, I think that's what you need, or, or or maybe a guy like a Sugar Ray Leonard who's at the same level in terms of ability, uh, yeah. but not but not Canelo. Now let's move on to another fight involving involving Floyd Mayweather, May second, two thousand nineteen, Mayweather versus Manny Pacquiao, two of the generation's best in a welterweight unification. Mayweather was thirty eight, Pacquiao was thirty six. Mayweather won a clear, a wide unanimous decision. Would the result have been different? five years before i i would never have favored pacquiao to beat mayweather but 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 a prime pacquiao the one who threw a thousand ridiculously quick punches from all sorts of crazy angles i think he would have given mayweather problems um he had already started to slow down when they actually fought in terms of his activity um he just wasn't quite the same at that point Uh, i know neither was mayweather but pacquiao was really a different fighter uh, if they met in their primes, I think it would have been a close fight. But Mayweather, who was, and we're going to go back again to his, especially his younger years, just super quick, athletic guy at his best. I just think he would have been too difficult for Pacquiao to hit cleanly enough to win the fight. Uh, I think Mayweather would have moved. He would have rolled, you know, whatever it took to avoid taking shots. Uh, and, he, and he would have done enough offensively to win rounds and then in the end to win the fight. You know, people might say, well, Jose Luis Castillo gave Mayweather problems with pressure. Why not Pacquiao? Well, first of all, yes, he gave May- uh, Castillo gave Mayweather some difficulty, but I still thought Mayweather won clearly in both of their fights. So, yeah, I gave him some problems, but he still lost uh, clearly to me. Uh, and that's a different kind of pressure. Uh, Castillo mauled Mayweather, kind of what we were talking about before. Pacquiao wasn't a mauler. He just threw a lot of punches from from different angles. Uh, I think if, Mon- if Juan Manuel Marquez could figure out Pacquiao, and he certainly did. Uh, I think Mayweather could have done the same thing. Yeah, you you raise an interesting point about Castillo because Jose Luis Castillo would have given Manny Pacquiao hell. Um, yeah, anybody well. hell. Yeah, yeah, he was just that good a fighter at at lightweight. But I don't even think that's like a prime version of Floyd. I, I think the one that moved up afterwards, the 140 version, early 147, he was truly in his prime at that point. Now Pacquiao, five years before, was probably a tick faster. Um, threw more punches, but he was also a little more reckless. I think he became wiser, craftier after the KO loss to Marquez. Now, Mayweather in his prime was more active, threw with meaner intentions, and 
he could have possibly gotten Manny out of there. I think at the very least, he could have just boxed his way to a unanimous decision like he did in 2015. But, you know, if Pacquiao got reckless against a prime sharpshooter like Floyd, who's looking at time link, he probably would catch him coming in. I mean, the man just had way too much in his arsenal. I don't know if folks, I always say this, will truly appreciate his genius until well after he's retired. Yeah, you know what, though? You could probably say the same thing about Pacquiao. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think we're talking we're talking about two of the greatest fighters. Oh, absolutely. Time. And I'd, I'd give anything if I could have seen them, seen that fight when they were in their prime. But uh, it is what it is. Yeah, it is. And you know what? They're probably not complaining. They probably made significantly more money. Um, That's true. In, in 2015. Yeah. Now, the third matchup on our list is between two guys who fought twice. Uh, Oscar De La Hoya and Julio Cesar Chavez, two legends of Mexican descent. They first fought at 140 pounds in 1996. Chavez was badly cut early on, and De La Hoya bludgeoned him. The fight was stopped in four rounds. Then they met two years later, this time at 147, and Oscar stopped him again, this time in eight rounds. Mike, would things have turned out differently when both Chavez and De La Hoya were at their peak? Well, this was... The hardest of the five for me to pick a winner. Um, I actually went back and forth uh, before I finally made a decision. Uh, De La Hoya was in his prime when he met Chavez, uh, but Chavez was self- several years past his, which is why those fights really weren't that competitive, that in the cut. Uh, Chavez at his best was a great, great fighter, skillful guy, smart, good ring IQ, durable as anyone maybe in the history of the sport, unbelievable chin. Uh, he would have been a tough out for anybody uh and i think you have to say that he was well i shouldn't say you have to say i say in in my opinion he was probably a little bit better than de la hoya when both of them were at their best uh i think the fight would have been close though they would have fought at around 135 pounds i think uh de la hoya was superb at that weight super quick and super powerful he had tremendous power at 135 pounds and below um chavez would have had a lot of trouble, I think, with De La Hoya's speed. And I think he would have felt his power, even though he probably would have survived it because of that chin. At the same time, but I think Chavez was just a little too good for De La Hoya at his very best. I think he would have found ways to get to De La Hoya and slow him down. And again, with that chin, I think he he would never have been stopped by De La Hoya. So I'm going to say, in the end, I decided Chavez by a razor-thin decision. Man, you had me on a roller coaster right there. I'm like, who's he? Who's he choosing there? I'm uh, surprised that you're going with Chavez. I think prime for pound, prime for prime, pound for pound, Julio Cesar Chavez pounds out a close decision win over Oscar De La Hoya. So we're we're in agreement there. I mean, I saw enough success for Chavez in the early rounds of their first encounter and throughout their second fight to suggest that a prime Chavez could have been a nightmare. Um, for Oscar, who was more of a one-handed fighter, I would say, throughout much of his career. You know, Chavez had the chin to withstand the flush shots, as you mentioned, and his defense, he he could slip punches and work his way in. I think he's underrated in that aspect. He had the body work to slow Oscar down and the conditioning to pull away late. Uh, you know, uh, we discussed this briefly last week, but I believe Oscar tended to fade in the late rounds. He did it against John John Molina, Miguel Angel Gonzalez. Felix Trinidad, Shea Mosley both times, Floyd Mayweather, Felix Sturm, and I suspect against uh, uh, an attrition fighter, an incredible attrition fighter like Chavez, the same thing happens. Yeah, you know what? That would have been another great, great fight. Any of these fights, that's the thing about what this exercise is, any of these fights, you know, you'd kill to actually see these guys fight in right. their primes, you know, when they were when they're at their very best. Um yeah, Chavez was better. I think he was just better. But, you know, he had problems with speed. He had problems with Frankie Randall. It's later on in his career. But he had problems with Frankie Randall. He had problems with Whitaker. Uh, I think, and, and Oscar was super fast, especially at the low, at the lower weights and, and hit really hard at 135 pounds. But, yeah, I, I think we're in agreement. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move on to the fourth fight on our list. November 9th, 1996. Evander, the real deal, Holyfield, scoring a huge upset over Iron Mike Tyson, stopping in the 11th round to become a three-time world heavyweight champion and beating great odds in the process. But what would have happened if they had originally fought in 1991 as they were slated to? Well, this might sound like sacrilege, but this is an easy one for me. Uh, Holyfield always had Tyson's number going back to the amateurs from every, from everything that I hear. It's funny that I would say that because I picked Tyson to beat Holyfield when they met for the first time in 1996. And 
and as everybody knows, I wasn't alone. Uh, Tyson was on a roll, uh, you know, in second version of, of Mike Tyson after he got out of prison. And Holyfield, <clears throat> excuse me, Holyfield seemed to be sliding. I remember he was coming off his, his fight against Bobby Chaz, and he just didn't look good at all. He didn't look like Holyfield at all. Uh, hence the odds, you know, that were, were crazy in, in Tyson's favor. Well, lo and behold, uh, Holyfield knocks him out late in the fight. Uh, incredible experience. And I was there. That was one of the, my favorite fights of all time. Uh, in their primes, I don't see how anything really would have gone differently. Uh, one liability that Holofield had uh, throughout his career as a heavyweight was that he was a small heavyweight, which is why he had trouble against Riddick Bowe and Lennox Lewis. In my opinion, he was clearly better than both of them, pound for pound. He was just too small. Uh, right. Tyson, Tyson was also a small heavyweight. So, so no one would have an advantage in that time. So Holofield wouldn't have that disadvantage. Uh, Holyfield was a really good boxer. He had power. He was really durable. And he was as mentally tough as anybody I've ever seen in boxing. Uh, I don't think he would have been intimidated at all by a young Tyson, which was sort of half the battle with most of the guys he fought. Uh, I think he would have stood up to him. I think he would have outboxed him. He would have taken whatever Tyson landed. And I think he would have delivered more in return. I think he would have been the first to stop Tyson, not Buster Douglas. Yeah, you know what? I agree with you. I, I actually picked Holyfield to win in 1996. Of course, the next fight is going to show you how good my acumen is when it comes to making picks. Not very good, so I'm not tooting my horn here. But, you know, I was in boarding school throughout much of uh, during Holyfield's slide and when Mike Tyson was in jail. So all I remembered was, you know, being a young kid and reading the papers and 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 watching Holyfield fights with my dad. And I thought he was just remarkable. And so in 1991, I remember the Daily News, New York Daily News had, had an article out about uh, the two of them potentially fighting. And back then they would actually print the rankings, like the heavyweight rankings in the newspaper, which is just crazy, crazy to me. Yeah. Um, and so I was, I was like, well, this is Holyfield's big chance. Of course he's going to win, you know? And, and I remember my dad, you know, saying, yeah, I think Holyfield's going to win. That's my man. He, I mean, he was a huge Holyfield fan. So when they finally fought in, um, 1996, and I, I returned to the U.S. from Ghana um, to finish out high school, I was convinced that Holyfield was going to win. I didn't know about the slide. I didn't know about the Bobby Chiz fight. So I was just like, well, clearly Holyfield's going to win this. And I remember pleading with my brother, like, you got to put money on this fight. Like, this is easy money right here. And he was like, what are you talking about? Um, of course, Holyfield proved me right. And so I would say that if they had fought in 1991, Holyfield wins uh, by decision, possibly a stoppage. I think he weathers any storm that Mike Tyson brings. And his skill and his will were just way too great. I mean, his his jab, the amazing footwork for a heavyweight combinations his ring iq too strong way too determined very strong chin uh, i'm pleasantly surprised that we're in agreement so far i'm getting my maybe i'm getting my date screwed up was he supposed to fight him in 91 that would have been after the douglas fight i think he was supposed to fight him in either in place of the douglas fight or yeah. after the douglas fight he oh, 1990 i should say then i'm sorry it may have been 1990 i'm not sure yeah. but no, no. Uh, but around yeah. there yeah you know it it, it who knows what happens in a fight like that? You know, Tyson obviously was a good, powerful heavyweight. Anything could have happened, but it just seems pretty obvious to me. Because you know, Holofield pound for pound. You know, I always tell people I've said this on the podcast probably more than once. If Holofield were a natural heavyweight, I honestly, truly believe he would have been the greatest heavyweight of all time, better than Ali, better than Joe Lewis. Uh, but pound for pound, he's one of the five best pound for pound fighters of my life. I think I really do. Uh, maybe I pick a guy like Jones and Mayweather ahead of him, but I think he's right there, right there with this guy. He's a great, great fighter, whereas Tyson was just a notch below. Yeah, it's amazing to think as great as Evander Holyfield is, he may be underrated. I mean, we may not fully appreciate just how good pound for pound he, he is. is. Yeah, yeah pound he, for pound he's he is. such yeah. a marvel. Now, our last fight, November 8th, 2008. Joe Calzaghe versus Roy Jones Jr. Calzaghe won a wide 12-round unanimous decision over the great Jones. But would things have been different if it was a prime version in the ring that night? This, you know, this actually might have been easier than the previous one. Um, I have a lot of respect for Calzaghe. His combination of uh, skill set, really skillful guy. And his natural gifts, he's a really good athlete. He's fast, athletic. Uh, it was really something to behold. Uh, and he deserves all the credit that he gets. You know, hence, he retired with a perfect record, which is really something. Uh, and he beat Jones. And albeit a Jones that was way, way past his prime. Um, Calzaghe couldn't have touched a prime Jones. Uh, the Welshman might have had... Uh, 
He might have actually had tighter, more polished technique, uh, but that's it. Uh, Jones had every other advantage. He's way faster, way, way more powerful. Kazagi wouldn't have wouldn't have known what hit him. Um, and he'd, and he'd get hit a lot. Uh, I think Jones would have taken Calzaghe out in the later rounds. I really do. Uh, and there would have been no shame in that uh, for Calzaghe. Very few fighters in history could have hung with Jones when he was when he was at his best. He was uh, what's beyond special. He was a, a true, true marvel when he was at his best. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think Calzaghe was tailor made for a prime Jones. Uh, you know, he was a come forward. Uh, aggressive fighter who threw a lot of punches. You know, in Jones's prime, he struggled with the patient counterpunchers, the Montel Griffins, you know, the the Eric Hardings, uh, the Antonio Tarvers, you know, um, guys guys who would who would counterpunch him, and and guys for the most part who were who were very very strong or, or had been at that weight longer than he had. Calzaghe coming up from 168, and, and Jones in his prime at 168 was just a freak of nature. Um, at 175, he was a, he was a, a freak of nature. I don't see anything that Calzaghe could do that would trouble Jones. I think Jones is all wrong for him. He'd walk into shots all night, and because Calzaghe wasn't exactly a hard hitter, uh, Jones who could be hesitant and 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 you know, um, gun shy at times. I don't think he'd be afraid to let his hands go at times. And I could see the, the stoppage. Calzaghe could be hurt. Heck in their fight in 2008, Jones dropped him in the first. And I thought so much of, of Jones and, and the bad style matchup that I actually picked Jones to beat Calzaghe in 2008. So, um, just goes to show you how much of a big, uh, a Jones fan I was then, but he was clearly way, way, way past his prime when he fought, when he fought kind of scary to think that, um, that he's still fighting now. Yeah. You know, again, I don't want to denigrate Calzaghe too much. He's a right. Hall of Famer who deserves to be there, but Jones was, uh, I mean, Jones again, I, Anybody in history would have problems with him when he was when he was at his best. He was right. just a, a special, special. He's probably I'm a little biased, I suppose, but because I, I'd say that he's probably my favorite fighter since Sugar Ray Leonard, which for me personally is saying quite a bit. Um, yeah, he's probably <laughs> probably shouldn't be fighting anymore. He probably should <laughs> probably should be hanging him up. He needs to go into the Hall of Fame. Right, right, exactly. And we we wait eagerly um, for that day. Now that is going to do it for this week's episode. As a reminder, guys, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment on the PBC podcast wherever you found us. Also, don't forget, Saturday night, PBC Boxing returns to Showtime, a triple header featuring David Benavides versus Ronald Ellis in a WBC World Super Middleweight title eliminator. Action starts at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And finally, for myself and Mike, Thank you guys, as always, for tuning in. Be sure to check us out next week for more Boxing Talk right here on the PBC Podcast. 